Hey, it's Pastor Mike. I'll keep this short because I know you want to listen to today's message. You're here because you want to continue growing in your faith, and we at Time of Grace want the exact same thing for you. Just visit us at timeofgrace.org, and you'll find a ton of resources at your fingertips, like sermons, videos, books, devotions, our blog, and of course, more podcasts. See you there. This week, we're talking about different vulnerabilities that we feel in our lives, and today we are going to be talking about the vulnerability to rejection, being rejected by someone. You ever been rejected by someone? I was. Um, I was cut from my eighth grade forensics team. The, uh, so forensics, that's public speaking. And uh, we, had an, we had a team in eighth grade and we were going to go to a forensics meet and there was only one slot left, but two of us who wanted to, uh, wanted to go to that one slot, to, to have that one slot <laughs> and go to the competition. And so the teacher had us give our presentations in front of the class and then the class would decide which one was better and who was going to be able to go to the competition. And so the first person went and she gave her presentation and then I went and I gave my presentation and then the class voted and I was rejected. <laughs> and I did not make the forensics team. And it felt awful that um, just a declaration that you will never do public speaking ever in your life. I think that was kind of funny. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. And even thinking about that now, while I can laugh about it now, it doesn't, that, that feeling of, being rejected is a really awful feeling. Do you know? Do you know what living being has a long history of being rejected? The sheep. The sheep. Just look in the Old Testament. Go back to the Old Testament when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and the very first Passover. That the way that the Israelites were going to be set free from their slavery in Egypt was they were supposed to take one of their sheep, the best one, in fact, the best one they have, and the sheep was supposed to be, in a sense, rejected. It was going to be killed and and thrown away, and its blood was supposed to be taken and put over the door frames. And that would be the sign when the Lord passed through that they would pass over those homes and the people inside the homes would be, would be safe. But those, those sheep needed to be rejected or thrown away in order for them to be safe. Go through the Old Testament and there are so many different types of sacrifices, sin sacrifices, guilt sacrifices, lots of different sacrifices. Over and over again, you get the people of God bringing their sheep these cute little fuzzy sheep to, uh, to the temple and sacrificing them, throwing them away, rejecting them as a way of saying, we love you, God. Um, it, was a pretty, it, was a pretty bloody, it was a pretty bloody thing. In fact, most of, the, most of the sacrifices in the Old Testament required a lot of blood. In fact, there was one day in the Old Testament that was exceptionally bloody. You know, I don't know if I would have enjoyed living in Israel during this time. If my stomach can't handle a whole lot of blood, and maybe yours can't either, so I'm glad God didn't have me live back then. But, but there was one day that was particularly bloody, and that was called the Day of Atonement. It was one of the high festivals, and what would happen on the Day of Atonement is that a sheep would be brought, and it would be sacrificed, it would be killed as a sacrifice for the sins of the priest who was serving. And then they would take the blood from that sheep, and put it in a bowl and the priest would go back into the back room of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was and then he would dip his hands into that bloody bowl and then he would take the blood on his hands and he would sprinkle them over the cover of the Ark and then he would dip and then he would do that seven times and then he would dip his hands in the bowl of, again and they would be covered with blood and then he would sprinkle them seven more times over a different area of the Ark of the Covenant. And then after he did that, the 14 times, then he would go back out to the front of the temple on the front steps and two goats would be brought to him. And one goat would be killed and its blood taken in a bowl and then he would take that bowl and go back into the back room again and he would dip his hands into the bowl of blood seven more times and sprinkle just like he did and then seven more times just like he did and then he would come back out to the front steps again having not washed his hands. And so picture what his hands are looking like. He has dipped his hands into a bowl of blood at least 28 times without washing them. And then he would take his hands that are covered in blood and then he would put them on top of the other goat's head and blame the goat for all of the people's sins all their mistakes. And then once he did that, he would send the goat away and it would go out into the wilderness all by itself where it would die in a lonely place. You know what that goat was called? It's called the scapegoat. A goat that was not guilty of any sins and yet it was blamed and punished as if it was the one who had committed all of those sins. And by doing all of this, with all these vulnerable sheep and vulnerable goats and lambs, God was highlighting two things. 
Number one, he sees the reality of our sins and they are a big deal to him. Every sin costs a life. That's what he wanted to emphasize with the blood. Sin costs a life. It's, it's not a small thing when we are impatient with one another, when we are unkind, or when we hold grudges or refuse to forgive. Those aren't small things. It costs a life. A life needs to be given. And we can feel vulnerable to that because on how many days can we go through when we don't feel guilty about anything? I don't know if there are any. We make mistakes, we commit sins, we hurt people, sometimes without even trying. And that makes our hearts sink. And we wonder if there's going to be a rejection coming from God. But that's the second point that God was making with the scapegoat. With giving them the picture of the scapegoat that would happen on every day of atonement, he was assuring them that one day I'm going to send a scapegoat for you. Somebody who is not guilty of any sin, but he's going to take the blood that's on our hands and it's going to be put on his head. And then he is going to go out and go die in a lonely place all by himself. Except it wasn't in a desert. It was on a cross. And the scapegoat was Jesus. And Jesus even announced that he was going to be that scapegoat when he said this. Talking to his disciples, he said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. He made himself vulnerable on a cross to take the punishment for our sins so that you could walk through life knowing that in Christ you are accepted. In Christ you are loved. In Christ you are always forgiven. And if you ever doubt that, you always get to go back and look at the Lamb. And it will always tell you the same thing.